Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to this, our third vodcast on our third book. This third book is Digital Hemlock, Internet Education and the Poisoning of Teaching. This book was published in 2002 with the University of New South Wales Press. So this is quite important. This is the third book that I published with the University of New South Wales Press and it was the last book that I published with them. And that's bittersweet, but also it was probably appropriate for that time. Digital Hemlock is a very precious book for me. It is the book that made my name. It's the book that created a particular mode of doing critical internet studies and thinking about digitisation, teaching and learning in new and innovative ways. It's also a very, very angry book. It is a book that is seething with rage. And that rage is triggered by what was happening to higher education, not only in Australia, but throughout the world. I believe passionately in what a university is and what a university can do. And what I was seeing was how digitisation, very simple, very basic template software interfaces were cheapening the teaching and the learning that we were doing in higher education. What was occurring at this time is particular manifestations of neoliberalism had entered higher education so that a group, a collective, a cluster of managers started to emerge in our universities. And these managers, this layer, this tier of management, these guys and girls didn't teach and they didn't research. They managed. And so they were terribly interested in efficiency and productivity and teaching and learning and high quality research and excellence and standards and international best practice. All that sort of stuff wasn't terribly relevant to them. They were trying to cut the costs of teaching and learning, particularly at undergraduate level. And digitisation was seen as a way to create a cut priced university degree. So Digital Hemlock was my response to this situation. I'd won uh, the National Teaching Award for the best teacher in the country and won a lot of different teaching awards in the previous few years. So I thought it was opportune that I started to spend some of that political capital and say, I'm an outstanding teacher, I've been awarded by this country for my teaching and the time has come for me to make a stand. So this book wasn't anti-digitisation. My entire career has been in fact very positive in terms of what digitisation can do. Social media, sonic media in particular, how that can enable learning. But it's not a replacement for the analogue experience of teaching and learning. About half of the degrees that I've done have been through online learning and they've been terrific. But they've been terrific because we started with the project of what makes a good online experience? What creates good online learning? Rather than what is the cheapest way to pump these students in and out of this degree? So what Digital Hemlock did was it brought together a cluster, the weird synergy that was emerging in higher education at this time of neoliberalism, managerialism, pretty straightforward, cheap and pretty crappy often, uh, digitisation and the disrespect of teaching and learning along with the disrespect of higher education. All that stuff came together in a perfect storm to, and it sort of meant that digitisation, the internet, became the answer for whatever question we would be asking in a university. So if teaching and learning, if academics were becoming a little bit expensive, ooh, just replace it with casualised staff members who can teach via a template. Ooh, libraries are becoming a little bit expensive. Ah, oh, right, well, Google can fix it. The internet can fix it. Well, you know, this is just bonkers stuff. So this book took a stand and it made a stand. It drew a line in the sand and said, you know what, enough. I'm not going to take this anymore. This is not good enough. The universities are too precious. Teaching and learning is too precious. Our students 
are too precious. And if they are going to have online learning, they deserve the best of online learning rather than what a, a group of managers who aren't very good teachers and don't do any research, what those managers think is high quality teaching and learning. This book made my name, it made my career. One of my favourite memories in my life was uh, I, I lived just across the way from Murdoch University and I was filling up my car at a Cardinia, where I used to live, it's a suburb in Western Australia, a Cardinia petrol station and I was in pain for my fuel and I saw the Australian newspaper and I saw on the front page my name and Digital Hemlock and the cover on the front page of the newspaper referring to a story deeper in the paper but it was an amazing experience where you suddenly realise you've tapped into something that your words, your writing, your book has made a difference and yes you know I was called a Luddite because after all what do women know about technology? Really? 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 So I was called a Luddite and you know a, a lot of abuse emerged from the men and they were often men who were earning money, were making a living in this new educational designer, educational technologist occupation that suddenly emerged in universities. I critiqued these guys very strongly saying well they may have the tech but the tech is easy. Have you got the content? Have you got the expertise? Do you know what international standards are in higher education? No? We'll shut the hell up. So needless to say those guys were very critical of me and very critical of this book but I also found a huge number of friends. I delivered hundreds of keynotes all over the world, Australia but all over the world. I had a chance to go to Frank Frankfurt and speak to the Frankfurt Book Fair which was just an absolute privilege, astounding. I also met hundreds, probably thousands of outstanding teachers and remarkable librarians who believed in me and believed in this book. And there are famous stories that are actually true where librarians would be buying 10 copies of Digital Hemlock and sending it anonymously to the senior managers of universities around Australia to say read this, rethink your position, work out what a university is for. So this book was published in 2002, it was written in one piece, it was written very quickly, it was powerful, it was potent, it had something to say. You know, did I lose? Yeah, I did, because that bad practice that I diagnosed in Digital Hemlock continued and we're living with and through that to this day. So the decisions I critiqued here, we're living with now. So we are running undergraduate programs throughout Australia, throughout the world, where the expectations of reading have reduced. The calibre and the quality of writing that we require has reduced. And we've accepted banality. We've accepted mediocrity. We've accepted compliance. Digital Hemlock, and I hope my career, has stood for excellence, has stood for the value of higher education to transform people's lives and also to transform the nations in which those students are being educated. So I am proud of Digital Hemlock. It entered a fight about higher education. It was a fight that I've lost, but it's a fight that I'm very proud I was part of and it is about the future of higher education and I will always stand for excellence, I will always stand for the best of what a university can do and that project and the performance of that project began with Digital Hemlock.